Today's video is brought to you by NordVPN. More on them in a bit. The 21st century tensions between the United States and Iran are well known, and the situation has come close to its boiling point several times in recent years. Whether it be from Iran mistakenly shooting down a Ukrainian passenger debt in 2020, the US assassinating one of Iran's highest ranking military officers in a drone strike, or the constant cyber attacks between the two nations, relations are about as bad as they have ever been. But what if this geopolitical powder keg was suddenly ignited? Today, we're going to explore the hypothetical future in which the United States launches an invasion of Iran and what the potential outcome of such a war could be. For starters, the United States public is really against starting another large-scale war in the Middle East. After the messy war in Iraq, the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, and numerous other US involvements in the 21st century, these seemingly unending conflicts have swallowed up trillions of dollars and thousands of American lives, and the US public is just not in the mood for another one. If the US wanted to invade Iran, then they would need a seriously good reason at this point, and the justification needs to be solid enough not only to get the American public on board, but also the rest of NATO. Fortunately for whoever would be planning such a war, there are quite a few realistic scenarios in which an invasion and toppling of Iran's regime could be suggested as a solution. First up, there's of course the nuclear scenario. The United States would likely invade Iran if new intelligence was uncovered showing that a covert Iranian nuclear program was close to developing a viable weapon. Invading a Middle Eastern country under the premise of WMDs probably sounds a bit familiar to you. The second scenario is the defensive scenario, where the US invades Iran as a response to Iranian aggression on a regional US ally. A plausible situation for this would be a large-scale Iranian attack on Israel, or possibly an attack on Saudi Arabia. Additionally, if Iran invaded one of its neighbors and disrupted global oil supplies in the process, you can count on the United States showing up in no time at all. The third scenario is one that has recently seemed more likely due to the events in late 2022. If Iran's treatment of its own population, especially of women, escalates even further, it's not hard to imagine a future where Iran is invaded under the pretense of liberating its people. All right, so we got the justification for invasion, whether it be nuclear defensive or a liberation mission, and now it's time to explore just how difficult this invasion would actually be to pull off and whether or not the United States is even up to the task. Iran's main advantage in defending its territory is its geography. For starters, Iran is straight up massive. It is the world's 17th largest nation, with a total land area of more than 1.6 million square kilometers, or more than 600,000 square miles. To put that in some perspective, it's about three times larger than all of France, or about the size of Alaska. And throughout this large area, there is plenty of rough terrain, like the Zagros Mountains, which stretch across much of Iran, and also the Alborz Range, which contains Iran's tallest mountain, the volcanic mountain. Damavand. This rugged landscape of mountains, hills, and valleys is a thorn in the side of any invading force and provides an ideal place for insurgents to hide. Additionally, Iran's deserts aren't well suited for mechanized crossing. In the Dasht-e Kavir, for example, also known as the Great Salt Desert, the landscape consists of a salt crust covering a deep layer of thick mud. One wrong step and you can easily break through the salt and find yourself stuck in the quagmire underneath, making it essentially impassable for vehicles and incredibly difficult to traverse on foot. A private intelligence firm called Stratfor has called this desert one of the most miserable places on Earth. Iran also benefits from a highly strategic location. If the United States wanted to launch an invasion, it needs a staging area to gather its forces. And Iran doesn't have a great land border for such an attack. In fact, of the seven countries Iran borders, not a single one is a great option. It's highly doubtful that Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, or Pakistan would want to get involved by allowing US troops to prepare on their soil, so the east is out of the question. Same goes for Azerbaijan and Armenia, who are a bit involved with a conflict between themselves and are perpetually under the gaze of an increasingly aggressive Russian Federation who might not be too happy if they were to aid the United States. It's unlikely that Iraq would stage the US invasion as well, as they would be opening up their own country to preemptive strikes as the military buildup became clear, and Iraq has been pushing for the US and its coalition forces to get out of its borders for years now. So that leaves us with one last option, Turkey, which at first glance is a NATO ally and seems promising, but there's little to no chance that Turkey lends a hand at all. 
Despite being a member of NATO, relations with Turkey have been a bit strained in recent times, especially in December 2022, when Turkey threatened Greece with ballistic missiles if they continued to purchase arms from the United States. And let's not forget, Turkey has refused to participate in similar situations in the past. When the US invaded Iraq in 2003, they intended for a large ground force to move into northern Iraq, but Turkey refused the passage. The US had to instead airlift just a few thousand paratroopers into the region, far less than they had hoped for. So, based on all of this, it would be a safe bet to assume Turkey is going to stay out of this hypothetical invasion of Iran. And that leaves the US without a single reliable land border into the country. Now, technically, Kuwait is very close to Iran, separated by just a thin stretch of Iraq. So, it might be feasible to just use this portion of Iraq without permission and hope it doesn't escalate. But that's an extreme move, and it risks losing international credibility for the invasion or even turning Iraq into a direct enemy in the conflict. Not to mention this part of Iraq, where the Euphrates and Tigris rivers meet, is a nasty, swampy nightmare, as Saddam Hussein found out when he tried to invade Iran in the 1980s. So, without a confirmed land route, the only way the United States is going to get a significant amount of troops into Iran is through its southern coastline, meaning that a large amphibious invasion is likely going to be a central feature of a war, but even this doesn't feel like a great option. Entering Iran from the coastline in the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Amman puts the invading forces on the opposite side of the country from Iran's capital, Tehran. A successful landing in the port city Bandar Abbas, for example, would put the invading forces more than a thousand kilometers or more than 600 miles from the capital. And that's only once the US is able to get to the actual coastline, as Iran has numerous fortified islands that the Americans will have to contend with before even attempting to establish a beachhead. And this is largely down to the fact that Iran is aware that the coastline is the most likely invasion point for any foreign power and has been building up its defenses here specifically to counter this. The many rocky coves and inlets are ideal places for small boats to hide, and these could be a serious threat to any approaching US ships. These smaller craft are a far bigger problem than you might expect. In 2002, the US military conducted simulated war games between Blue Team, United States, and Red Team, a fictitious Persian Gulf state, which was clearly meant to portray Iran or Iraq. Obviously, at a disadvantage against the United States, the Red Team came up with some pretty ingenious tactics to win many of the simulated battles. To evade interception of their communications, they used motorcycle couriers and old-fashioned light signals, and when the Blue Team brought in the might of their navy, Red Team launched a huge barrage of cruise missiles, so many that it overwhelmed the ship's radars. Following the missiles, they launched a wave of smaller boats running hit and run as well as kamikaze missions. The small boats were so numerous and so close to the larger warships that they had trouble detecting and fighting them, essentially leaving them sitting ducks. Have you ever connected to a free Wi-Fi hotspot at a coffee shop and thought you're just doing something totally normal? Yeah. Me too. Well, think again. That Wi-Fi could actually be hosted by someone trying to steal your information. Don't let that happen to you. Always check for the lock and HTTPS symbol and use NordVPN to encrypt your data. Not only does NordVPN's threat protection feature protect you from ads, trackers, and malware and sketchy coffee shop Wi-Fi, but you can also use it on six devices on all major platforms. Say goodbye to geo restrictions and hello to a secure online experience with NordVPN. That means that you can watch a much wider variety of streaming options, which is nice, and also shop from different locations, meaning you can often find a better deal. And the best part, they offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. Get an exclusive deal by visiting nordvpn.com slash warographics. There's also a link below. Stay safe, enjoy your coffee, and now the rest of today's video. When all was said and done, the Red Team that simulated Iran had destroyed 16 US warships, including an aircraft carrier, in an attack that, if carried out in real life, would have killed an estimated 20,000 American service members. Red Team's underdog victory had been led by Lieutenant General Paul Riper, a Marine with years of experience from the Vietnam War and the Gulf War. Unfortunately for Paul Riper, his superiors weren't too happy with losing, and so the whole simulation was redone with a few new constraints. The location of Red Team's troops were given to the enemy. They were ordered to not shoot down any of Blue's air assets, and certain weapons were banned from the war game. Of course, after these new rules had been added, the US went on to a crushing victory. Not really a surprise there. These exercises known as the Millennium Challenge 2002 really showed how unprepared the US was for an asymmetric strike during an amphibious landing. Paul Riper criticized his command, saying that they had to rig the game in order to win, but he was brushed off.
Now, keep in mind, this was 20 years ago, and it's unlikely that any Iranian officer would have nearly the same knowledge of the inner workings of the US military like Paul Ryber and his team did. But the point still stands. Approaching Iran's beaches might be a lot harder than expected, and if they play their cards right, Iran's initial defenses could deal some serious damage before US troops have even set foot on their land. Now, before we get into our predictions for how the war would actually go, let's briefly go over how each army stacks up against the other. First up, air power. We'll be pulling our stats from the World Directory of Modern Military Aircraft, who have analyzed the world's air forces and ranked them according to their global air power ranking. The Islamic Republic of Iran Air Force ranks as number 43 in the world, with their most notable assets including 63 F-4 Phantoms and 26 F-14s, which they received from the United States back in the 1970s. They also field some Russian imports such as the Su-24 attack aircraft and a few Chinese models such as the F-7. These are some reliable jets for sure, but a big problem Iran would face with using them in combat is a lack of maintenance and repair parts, especially for the American-made jets, thanks to intense sanctions. Overall, though, their air force possesses 343 active aircraft. The Iranian Army Aviation, which ranks at number 85, has 75 helicopters in active service, including both transport and attack helicopters. The Iranian Navy, whose air power ranks at 88, has 27 more helicopters, including some specialized for anti-submarine roles. Now, onto the United States, whose air power is, well, frankly, ridiculous. The US Air Force ranks as number one in the world, the US Navy ranks as number two, the US Army ranks as number four, and the US Marines rank as number five. And that's just for their air power. With these branches combined, the US has about 14,000 total aircraft, and we don't have time to go over every individual model, but the highlights include its best in the world fighters like the F 22 Raptor and the F 35 Lightning II, and the B 2 Stealth Bomber and the fearsome Apache attack helicopter. The US has no shortage of transport, strike, and training aircraft, all of which are top of the line. With the difficult terrain inside Iran, maintaining air superiority would be crucial for a US victory, and Iran will do everything they can to deny this. The navies tell a similar story, with Iran ranking at number 18 with 66 vessels, and the US ranking at number 1 with 243, which includes 11 aircraft carriers. Iran's ace up their sleeve here is their 25 submarines, which could be a surprising nuisance once US ships start arriving in the Persian Gulf. As for ground vehicles, though, Iran finally stands up to the United States. With 2,800 tanks, 2,400 multiple rocket launch systems, and several thousand various armored vehicles and artillery, Iran has some of the strongest ground forces on Earth. The US has more tanks, more than 6,000 in fact, but they're actually outmatched when it comes to towed artillery and multiple rocket launch systems. However, as we've seen with Russia's failure to advance deep into Ukraine, sometimes it's more about these vehicles' quality than their quantity. Iran currently has 575,000 active personnel with 350,000 in reserve. However, once a war with the US is underway, we can expect full mobilization to defend the country, which means they could dip into an estimated 40 million citizens considered fit for service. And you might think that if the US was arriving under the guise of liberation, that many of the citizens would either refuse to fight or even aid the Americans. But this is far from a predictable variable. It's definitely possible that they would join forces in overthrowing their government, but it's also possible that an invasion would rally the country together against the occupying force, much like what happened in the 1980s when Iran was invaded by Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Saddam had hoped to crush the Islamist movement before it solidified its governmental power, but all he managed to do was unite Iran against a common enemy. So, now let's get into what we're all here for. If we had to predict how the invasion would play out, here's what we think would most likely happen. Sometime in the near future, the CIA sends a troubling report to the President of the United States. Intelligence networks have uncovered a hidden Iranian nuclear program, and according to the reports, they're dangerously close to developing a bomb. After a whole lot of nothing gets done in the United Nations, the United States decides to take matters into its own hands and begins preparing to invade Iran, aiming to occupy the nation, locate and destroy this covert nuclear program, and install a local democracy. US allies are a bit hesitant about the whole affair, still fresh in their minds as the controversy surrounding the 2003 invasion of Iraq when no weapons of mass destruction were found. With this hesitancy, NATO allies declined to send troops directly into the invasion, but they do agree to aid with any preliminary logistical operations and
and reconnaissance missions. Likewise, US allies Saudi Arabia and the UAE aren't too keen to send their own militaries, but agree to let the United States use their territory to stage their invasion. Most analysts have estimated that to both invade and occupy Iran, the US would need at the very least 600,000 troops, but potentially as many as 800,000 or more. For the invasion of Iraq, the coalition forces totaled nearly 600,000 as well, but as we've just covered, invading Iran is going to be much, much more difficult than Iraq. As the months go by, these troops are brought into the forward bases being set up in the Persian Gulf, and intense training is underway to prepare them for what lies ahead. Iran, obviously, sees all of this happening and begins its own preparations to defend. Knowing that their southern coastline is going to be the major target, they begin transferring more troops southward, all while Iran begins to import weapons from Russia. Russia sees this as a perfect way to get back at the United States for so heavily supporting Ukraine and begins selling multiple rocket launch systems and even some stockpiles of guided munitions. Depleted by the war in Ukraine, though, these Russian weapon sales aren't nearly as much as they would have been had the war started before 2022. While the US continues gathering its forces across the Persian Gulf, it's possible that Iran could launch preliminary missile strikes. After all, the United States Central Command estimates that Iran possesses at least 3,000 ballistic missiles. This is certainly a possibility, but in our opinion, it's unlikely. US air defense systems would make a successful strike anything but guaranteed, and Iran knows they'll need all the firepower they can get for when the war actually starts. And they wouldn't dare use their fighter jets in such a risky strike, as their number is severely limited and they'll be crucial for defending their own skies. However, what Iran will certainly be doing is stirring up rebels in Iraq and Syria, hoping to draw some US attention to its other deployments. They've also been doing this for years, supplying militant groups such as Qaitib Hezbollah, which has fired rockets at US soldiers on many occasions. It would be expected that they'd amp up the supplies in this scenario. After months of preparation, the first direct conflict breaks out as US preliminary bombing operations begin. This is something that's often overlooked when people are discussing a hypothetical invasion, but it would absolutely precede the amphibious assault. We're talking weeks of airstrikes, taking down critical targets across the country, but especially assets like radar, airfields, and ammunition depots. Iran scrambles many of its jets to the sky and uses anti-aircraft missiles where it can, such as the S-300 imported from Russia. It's during these bombing runs that the first US casualty is announced, when an American aircraft is shot down on a mission over the Zagros Mountains, a kill celebrated by the Iranian military. Speaking of which, it would be pretty much impossible to predict the morale of the average Iranian soldier. It's possible that huge waves would surrender or abandon their ranks, but again, the opposite is also possible. For this scenario, we'll assume that the majority stay determined to defend their country. After several weeks of bombing, the amphibious assault is underway, and US ships begin crossing the Persian Gulf. Iran's coastal defenses have been shredded up by the weeks of bombing runs, but plenty remain, having been hidden in the rocky terrain. As thousands of US troops begin landing on the coast in a few key locations, they come under fire from Iranian artillery while ballistic missiles target the ships. Despite the fierce resistance, the overwhelming American forces capture the beaches relatively quickly, but now the reality of Iran sets in as a long trek northward awaits the arriving troops. Crossing through the Zagros Mountains would likely be the most difficult step yet. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC, have been ready for years to fight a guerrilla war through these mountains and do their best to stop an invading army from reaching the northern cities. The US would have to make good use of helicopters and drones to make their way through these mountains, but we can guess that they will suffer heavy casualties in this phase of the fight. And because the IRGC is special units designated to stay behind in enemy territory and strike supply lines, the US will need to maintain a strong presence here, costing valuable supplies and manpower throughout the occupation. As the US forces make their way northward and begin capturing larger cities, the asymmetric war starts to show its ugly face. Iranian armed forces and paramilitary set up deadly ambushes in cities and disguising themselves as civilians. It would be the brutal, long-term urban combat seen in Iraq, but on a much larger scale. After all, Iran has more than three times the population Iraq did in 2003. Cities like Shiraz, a city just past the Zagros Mountains, which has more than 1.5 million residents, would be a nightmare to occupy. And this, in turn, would be nothing compared to taking the capital. The next phase of the war would be continuing northward, with US armored vehicles sticking mostly to Iran's roads. Huge tank battles ensue as they near population centers, with the US M1 Abrams spearheading attacks against Iran's various tank battalions, which include their new Kara, along with hundreds of older Soviet T-72s and T-62s. The US emerges victorious from these armored bouts, largely thanks to close air support and more advanced munitions, but still takes a fair amount of casualties and damage simply due to the sheer number of Iranian vehicles. 
At this point in the invasion, with the US taking over a slice of Iran from the coast to its center, their supply lines would start to be stretched incredibly thin, which would likely stall the northward advance a fair bit. Effective logistics would be an incredibly important part of this invasion, and if they fail, the whole operation would crumble. When the time finally came, though, the Battle of Tehran has the potential to be the deadliest battle of the 21st century thus far. Tehran has a metropolitan population of nearly 16 million, and would probably be the hardest challenge the modern US military has ever faced. And if a chunk of its residents put up resistance, it would only be exponentially more difficult. If it takes Iran months or more than a year to capitulate, we could be looking at tens of thousands of US casualties, and that's at a minimum. And this doesn't even take into account the toll on Iranian civilians who will inevitably end up in the crossfire. And remember, occupying Tehran doesn't automatically mean the war is over. Even if the government surrenders, paramilitary and rebel units will move into the mountains and desert and urban streets and into neighboring nations for weapons and recruiting. Russia would almost certainly begin supplying rebels to fight the occupation, and groups like ISIS would see a renewed vigor in the region. There's also the possibility that Iranian cells around the world would begin targeting U.S. assets in retaliation. If anything, once Tehran falls, the war is only halfway finished, and the occupation is going to be nothing short of a nightmare. If you take one thing away from today's episode, let it be this. Overall, it's more than likely that the US invasion would succeed if they truly wanted it to, though the same can't be said for the occupation. At the end of the day, though, there's almost no chance that such an invasion would be worth the cost. And this is what Iran is largely banking on. Despite their geographic advantages, they don't stand much of a chance in a head-to-head -head war against the most powerful armed forces on the planet. But if they can make the prospect of an invasion seem unimaginatively costly, they know that the United States would never even consider it.